Shalom, and welcome to the Jewish Disability Services Together We Make an Impact podcast. This is Adam. And I'm Rose. And on today's episode, we are grateful to have Elizabeth Reichart here to share some of her lived experiences. Elizabeth, just from getting to know you over social media over the years, you have such a wide array of life experiences. And I'm wondering if right off the bat, there's anything that you want our listeners to know about you. Yeah, well, um, my name is Elizabeth. I am neurodivergent, disabled, a photographer, a speaker. I love disability. I love my community. And I have been interested in speaking on disability actually since I was a child in elementary school. It's it's a passion of mine and I love representing our community. That's wonderful. So one of the things that we're particularly interested in is your role as a photographer. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you got started in that space. I've always loved art and I've always wanted to be an artist. I don't have the best or any drawing ability or anything like that. But when I was really sick back in 2016, I was basically homebound and I wound up getting pretty bored. So I bought a used camera and started photographing my cats. And that's basically how I initially learned photography is practicing on Watson and Rocky. And after I started healing and getting better, a friend invited me to a drag show, a local one in a club that's sadly closed down now, but it's called Attitudes in St. Louis. And she told me to bring my camera. So I did. And that's where I really fell in love with photography. I loved capturing moments that could never be recreated. I loved capturing expression and it was really great. After that, I started moving on to concerts and things like that, but I realized that there was a real lack of representation in photography with disability, particularly um, the boudoir space. So that's where I started doing adaptive boudoir. And since then I've kind of picked up everything that's disability and photography related. I love adaptive fashion. I love adaptive athletics. I love um, photographing for the Down Syndrome Association calendar. Just anything with disability is is really in my heart to capture and show people how they want to be shown to the world. So often we in the disability community are told how we are going to be shown to the world. And my goal is to show people how they want to be shown. I love that. One of our next questions was going to be about why disability representation matters, but I think you really explained it so eloquently. Is there anything more that you want to add on that topic? When did you, did you watch Dancing with the Stars at all? Do you ever watch that? Not regularly, but go on. So I don't regularly either, but this past year, Selma Blair was on Dancing with the Stars and she danced with her cane. And as little as we see wheelchair representation, cane representation is even lower. And she, she danced with her cane and it was, it brought tears to my eyes to see, I, I had never seen myself like that before represented in that way. And then she sadly had to drop out because it was too much for her. But even that type of representation was incredible for me because I saw someone try their hardest, still have to take a break. And it made me realize that when that happens for me, it doesn't make me less of a person because this superstar has to do it and she's taking care of herself. I should take care of myself too. It, it was a, an amazing experience to witness. And then with my photography, there's a couple that I photographed. I did a couple's boudoir shoot with them. And when the photos came back, they, they said they have never seen themselves represented in that way. They've never seen themselves just as a, as a couple. This, this, these two people are both disabled and they have very visible disabilities. And when they saw the photos, it was just, it was just them being themselves. And that's, that's my goal. Like some people photograph people in wheelchairs, for example, and there's such a definite feeling of pity. And when I do it, it's, 
not necessarily strength because maybe that's not what they want to show, but it's strength or it's sexiness or it's pride or whatever. But I try to get these. I always ask my models, give me three adjectives that describe yourself. And they usually hate this question because they don't know how to answer. But when they eventually do, it's so helpful to me because that's what I want to pull out of you. I want I want you to be seen how you choose, not how the world chooses. Elizabeth, that is so beautiful in the sentiments that you have. I was curious uh, as as a photographer myself, um, you know, how is it that you work? You know, you gave some examples here of, of adjectives, but um, what are methods that you use to work with uh, with clients to really help them to embrace um, their disability and showcase it in such a positive, you know, art forum? I really like to get to know my models as much as I can. I think that's so important to have that personal connection. I also like to know their limitations because if there's a pose I want to get them in, for example, I, I don't want that to be a barrier. I want that to be a an asset we use for, like, possibly like an asset we can use for for the photos. It, it doesn't have to, barriers, they, they don't have to limit us. Okay, so this is kind of going backwards, but when I... um started using a wheelchair in my photography because I got more sick and I needed a wheelchair and I had to really change how I did some things. And at first it seemed like being limited to that space. I used to be known for going all over when I photographed under tables, hanging from things, all sorts of things. That's what I was known for. And then I had to start using a wheelchair and you would think that being confined to a space would make it so much harder. And at first it was, but then I realized how much bigger my opportunities were for photographing because I was confined to this space. With those barriers, with those limitations, I actually expanded what I was able to do. And that's how I feel with my models. If you have these barriers you have to work within, these confines you have to work within, but it actually expands your opportunities once you get to know the person and who they are and what they want to be. I love that idea of barriers being almost a creative scaffold of sorts. Exactly. Yeah. It's something to work off of, not something to work against. Thank you for that perspective. Is there anything like when you think of disability representation in mainstream media right now, be it advertising campaigns or, you know, in stores on billboards, are there any things in particular that you want to see more of or less of when you're looking at those things? Like what goes through your mind when you see someone say in the target ad in a wheelchair? I, I do love the target ads. I, I do like that just because I've seen what it does for kids in wheelchairs when they see themselves like that. It's, it's such a powerful moment to, to see someone who looks like you in a public, in a place like target where you're, surrounded by people, but you still might feel really alone because you're different. And then you see someone like you. It's, I mean, it's the same as like the wheelchair nods. Sometimes we give each other when we see each other like across. I don't know. Maybe it's just me that does it. But I get very happy when I see somebody else in a wheelchair and I see myself. So when I see myself blown up on a on a billboard or the sign in Target or whatever, it's, it's huge. What I want to see more of, though, is a, a bigger a bigger variety of disabilities working. And that's actually what I'm working on right now. I got a grant from Shutterstock um, to diversify their stock photography library. And what I'm doing is taking a lot of photos of people with developmental disabilities at their place of employment. I am about to shoot this guy. His name is Jack, he makes granola. He's awesome and I'm gonna photograph him in his kitchen and then at the farmer's market working. I'm going to do a coffee shop as well. I have just a bunch of different places. Oh, there's a, there's a place where they like an assembly line type thing. But whenever we see disability, people with disabilities working, it's almost always a person in a wheelchair at the end. And people with developmental disabilities have just as big of a spectrum of, of wants and desires as we do. They have relationships, they have goals and dreams and jobs and that's never represented and I met I met the sweetest couple when I was doing the uh the down syndrome shoot and they've been together for I think three years and plan on getting married and that's not represented and so that's what I want to see more of I, the wheelchairs are great and it's awesome but I want to see 
a bigger variety and I want to see less of inaccurate wheelchairs. There's so many photos and it's a hospital wheelchair, just like out in the world. And that's not what happens. I want to see fewer old people in wheelchairs because we have enough of that. And I want to see fewer people pushing the wheelchair. That really gets on my nerves because <laughs> I know I don't like to be pushed and I don't know anybody who does unless like we're tired <laughs> or something, but just on a regular basis. No. So why is it that they're always being pushed and, and like maneuvered and manipulated when they can clearly do it themselves? Like, I don't understand. So yeah, that's what I want to see less of, less of this an inaccurate wheelchair representation, but more variety of disabilities. It's, it's really sad that with representation, disability has seemed to be more limited. Like in the, in the society's eye, it's gotten smaller with representation which is bizarre to me because it's, it's such a beautiful community and we can all do so many things and we should all be shown. That's awesome. I'm really grateful for the answers that you gave because that would not have crossed my mind. Uh, Adam, do you have a question? Yeah, Elizabeth, I was just thinking as you were discussing, you know, the importance of diversity and representation in the disabled community uh, in the media. I was wondering your thoughts on, uh, on authentic casting and, and that process of, you know, really ensuring that people with disabilities are being portrayed appropriately. So those that are actors or models with disabilities are, are truly playing those same roles. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts and experiences have been on, on that part. Cause I know it can be really challenging sometimes to navigate those pieces. It, it can be because there are so many people wondering what acting is at this point. Is it just about somebody living out their lived experiences? And there's really more to it than that. It's more, it's more than just, can this person play it authentically? To me, it is at least, this is my opinion. It's about equity and a, it's, well, an able-bodied person can play any role. A disabled person is pretty much, if they're using a wheelchair, they can only play roles with a wheelchair. And it's sim it's very similar to cisgendered actors playing trans characters. Like, they can go anywhere, but the trans characters are pretty much limited. So if you take away these opportunities for these disabled actors, these trans actors, they're left with nothing. And I, I don't think that a, a good actor would have a hard time representing disability. That's not my concern. Some people say you have to have lived it to be able to portray it. And I don't really agree with that because there are good actors out there. What I think it's all about equity within the employment of the actors. And if you're taking away these chances, then what what's left? And that takes away some really good actors. Like there are amazing actors out there that just happen to be disabled and you're taking away any chance that they could have. Thank you so much for that perspective. It's always interesting with this debate, and I think you add some really great takes and angles that I would not have thought of otherwise. So thank you for sharing that. Um, are there any projects or campaigns out there right now that you are seeing of or hearing of that make you really excited? I I love the Target and the Ulta ones just because I've seen photographs of people really appreciating and experience, experiencing and appreciating them and seeing themselves and just so it's more the outcome of those campaigns and the campaigns themselves i would love to shoot target earl too though especially target is one of my big ones i would love to shoot there's there's so many different fashion lines now that are doing adaptive fashion though that people don't even know about it's like the fastest growing fashion niche right now i'm actually preparing to possibly go to new york this September and the person who's sending me asked me for a list of fashion companies that I would want to work with who have adaptive lines and I sent it to him and he was like wait these all have adaptive lines and I'm like well they all have at least some adaptive pieces and people just aren't aware of it the awareness needs to get out more and it's it's really exciting that everyone has a chance to express themselves through their clothing now instead of being restricted to what, what they may have been in the past. And, and it's really exciting that the representation is being shown in the modeling and in the design. And what I want to do is get the representation behind the lens as well, because I have a connection with these disabled models that an able-bodied photographer just won't have. 
we we have we can see each other in a different way that I can show in my in my photos. That's so exciting. Well, if you, when you make it to New York, if you feel like reaching out, let us know. That's so exciting. Absolutely. I, I, I've I never been so, and I've wanted to go since I was real little because I'm a huge Broadway fan. So I'm stoked. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. I'm very excited for you. If you need help planning anything, I'm a message away. Absolutely. Are there any other major topics that you want our listeners to know when it comes to disability and representation and just like being seen in different spaces in this world? You have the opportunity to represent yourself. You have the opportunity to make your own art. If you're not seeing yourself somewhere, then either find a photographer and collaborate with them or take your own self-portraits because we need more perspectives in this world. We need more art in this world. And if you want yourself to be seen, you can do that. You can, with social media and technology now, you can create your own art that represents you and put it out there for the world to see. And we want to see it. We want to see you, how you see yourself, because there are enough perspectives of certain types of people. And we want to see you. We want to see your perspective. We want to see how you see yourself, how you see the world. So you don't have to wait for somebody else to do it. You can take it upon yourself to to show yourself to the world. But also, if you need help, I am just a click away. That's awesome. So on that topic, if our listeners want to reach out to you with questions or find out more about your work, uh, where can they find you? Sure. I um, am on Instagram at Liz Reichart, at L-I-Z. R-A-J-C-H-A-R-T. I am on TikTok at That Wheelchair Photog. That Wheelchair, P-H-O-T-O-G. Oh, that one was tough. <laughs> and my website is my name, ElizabethRaycart.com. E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H-R-A-J-C-H-A-R-T.com. And you can find me on Facebook as well. Same name. And I have a blog on my website. And reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to hear what anybody has to say or any questions. Any I love talking to people. So feel free to drop a DM or whatever and say, hey. Elizabeth, I'm so thankful that you're able to join us today. And I know our listeners um, are going to just love your infectious um, personality and your like zest for life and just showing the beauty of the disabled community. So again, thank you so much for being here and sharing your experiences. I know your message will truly resonate with our listeners. Early in this episode, we had a great conversation with Elizabeth Reichart about loving yourself and the importance of authentic representation in the media. We're excited to blend that conversation with your knowledge and expertise on what being loved and respected in your relationship looks like and making our listeners aware of the signs and resources in the event that this is not the case. Conversations about healthy relationships are important for everyone, but particularly for people with disabilities who are at an increased risk of interpersonal violence because they have a higher volume of intimate support needs. So with that being said, we are very excited to welcome our guests, Hillary and Marcy. Thank you guys so much for coming. And to kick us off, can you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what Project Sarah is? Hi, I'm Marcy Rosenstein. I'm the assistant coordinator for Project Sarah, which is part of Jewish Family and Children's Service. And I'm Hilary Platt, the coordinator for Project Sarah. And as Marcy said, we are the domestic abuse division for Jewish Family and Children's Service. And It's also pretty cool that Sarah is also a code word. So this is on our brochures, but um, if somebody calls, all they have to do is ask for Sarah. And then anybody who answers the phone knows that it's a domestic violence call and they immediately ask, are you safe? Do you need us to call 911? And if it's If it's not the case, then um, they contact Marcy and myself and we get back in touch with the caller and um, we see what we can do to support them. But it's cool because um, it's very difficult to have to tell your story over and over again. So the code word really eliminates that discomfort. 
So Project Sarah, also just to let everyone know, we are not a crisis center. So if you are in the middle of an actual crisis, the best thing to do is either contact the police um, or if you have to get out of your home immediately to contact the local shelters. Everyone who answers the phone at JFCS has all this information at your fingertips. But Marcy and I, um, although our program is on a smaller scale scale compared to like the shelters that are run by the county, what we offer is that real advocacy of one-on-one. We give you so much attention and uh, we also try to fill in the gaps um, if our clients are with other programs that are super big and maybe can't, you know, um, take the time because they have so many clients. So I think we're lucky in, in that aspect that we can really give such specific attention to our clients. That's wonderful. Just a question. Are most of your services one-on-one? Are they group-based? Like, what does it look like, your client interactions? That's a great question. So all of our clients get one-on-one case management, but we created a, a domestic violence support group several years ago. And when COVID hit, it was in the middle of a support group that was in person. So we had to stop for a while. And then we pivoted to virtual because of COVID. And we found that it is such a success because most of our clients either don't even have transportation or they don't have childcare, they can't leave their children. So it's so much more accessible that we have a wait list of like 20 clients for the next group before we even start it. So it's been hugely successful. And sometimes people call just for the group, they just need that extra support. People in our groups are either in the abuse and deciding if they wanna leave or they need the extra support for that, or they are planning to leave in the midst of it or they are out of it. And some of our clients have been out. Our last group, we had a client that was out for 10 years, but there is so much co-parenting abuse that goes on that even though you're out of the situation, the financial and the co-parenting abuse and the emotional abuse continues. So the fact that they can get that support is amazing. And additionally, it's wonderful for everyone in the group because they can see maybe I'm in the midst of it, but now I can, um, see this person, my support group that is a year out, five years out, 10 years out, and their kids are happy and and they have a good social life and things are stabilized. So it's so wonderful for them to see that this is a moment in time that is absolutely challenging and horrible, but you can get through it. So oftentimes when, when Marcy and I talk about resources and different things in group, all of a sudden our group members will reach out to us saying, can I have help with that? And then they become the one-on-one case management clients as well. And our group has been wonderful because in addition, all the ladies uh, will refer to our group if they you know, have friends that are going through the same thing. So we've really reached so many people during COVID and since COVID because of our group, but we take a lot of pride in our one-on-one case management. Yeah, Hillary and Marcy, it's so wonderful to see what it is that you're doing to provide resources and tangible access to those that really need help when it comes to domestic abuse and violence. Something that we try to do here on our podcast and for our listeners is to help them to advocate for themselves and when they can't, to know that people in their lives can help to advocate for them when their voice isn't loud enough or strong enough. So I'm wondering if you can share with our listeners, uh, what are some signs that people should look for if they're concerned about a relationship that they're currently in, or perhaps one that they witness of their loved ones? Sure. Um, So the one thing I want to start with is that, um, you know, an abusive relationship is about power and control. It's never about love. So that's something that's important to keep in mind. Also that, This happens in relationships. It doesn't matter your sexuality and it doesn't matter your gender. So it happens to men and happens to women. It happens in homosexual relationships, heterosexual relationships. So we all have to be on the lookout for everyone we know in our lives. So, um, you know, if you're in a relationship and you find that you're constantly walking on eggshells to avoid confrontation or lying or, or keeping holding things back because you're worried about your partner's reaction, that's a red flag. Um, If you're embarrassed by your partner's behavior or reactions and you're lying to cover up to so that friends don't know that's a big red flag um another is jealousy you know everyone gets jealous sometimes 
but there's a difference between jealousy because you care and jealousy because you're controlling. So does your partner question when you want to time, spend time apart? Are they suspicious of you? And oftentimes that jealousy nowadays can come in um, the form of digital abuse. So digital abuse is like, does your partner want to see your phone whenever they want it, whenever they feel like it? Or, um, you know, do they want insist on knowing your passcodes and your passwords? Do they track you without your permission or even with your permission, but without your real consent? Um, do they require that you check in so they know where you are all the time or who you're with? Um, do they respect your boundaries? You know, all of us in every relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship or not, we have boundaries. So do they respect your physical boundaries when you are not in the mood to be touched, whether it's sexual or just, you know, a hug or a pat on the shoulder? Do they respect that? Um, especially if you've been in a long-term relationship and you're no longer maybe verbally um, and saying, yes, it's okay to touch me. But, you know, if you're using nonverbal cues, are those respected? You know, if you shrug off and they continue to approach you physically, that's not okay. Um, and if they, if they get into your boundaries and you try to set a boundary and say, look, this bothered me, and they say, okay, then do they actually listen do they do their words match their actions if they say okay I won't do that anymore and then they continue to do it then you know that they're not really telling the truth that they're not respecting your boundaries um do they put you down do they gaslight you you know uh, a healthy relationship is about lifting the other person up and feeling lifted up by that person so are they lifting you up or are they putting you down are they making you feel crazy? Like, are they gaslighting you, gaslighting you, manipulating you emotionally so that you're going, wait, I think this just happened, but did it really happen that way? Because they're saying the opposite thing. Um, do they blame you for things? Say, well, you're too sensitive. Um, and then there's financial red flags. Financial abuse is one of the things we really see the most. Um, do they, you know, do you have equal access to bank accounts? Can you see what's going on with your finances? Um, are you working? Are you not working because they told you not to work because that's something that's that they're insisting upon and it goes against your wishes. Um, and if you do work, are they controlling the money that you earn? Do you have an equal say in the financial decisions in your house um, or your relationship? If you have children, um, you know, are they using the children as sort of a bargaining chip or reason to make you stay? Um, sometimes abuse comes in the form of, are they forcing you to have more children than you want to have? Um, you know, when, with financial abuse, having um, children dependent upon you, um, you know, housing issues, those all are things that make it much harder to stay. So if you look out for those red flags um, early on, you know, no relationship starts abusive in the beginning. When we talk to high schools, the example we often give is if you go on a first date and you get punched in the stomach by your date, you're not going on a second date. So that's not how abuse happens. It happens over time. They love bomb you. They make you feel special. And then if you start to notice, well, that behavior is changing and, and now something something off happened and you're maybe questioning it and then they start love bombing you again, that's a cycle. So that's another thing to look out for. You know, um, when you guys talked about authentic representation in the media, so many things popped up in my head. So for instance, Marcy mentioned our BHR, our Building Healthy Relationships Program, which we speak to teens in um, schools, Hebrew highs, any kind of facility, eighth through 12th grade. And people do not realize how many young kids are affected by abuse. We spoke to over 2,500 students this year and 23% on an anonymous survey said that they had already experienced an unhealthy relationship and 43% say they know a friend who has experienced this. So this is really eye-opening and this really gives us the tools we need to keep going into the schools for the schools to realize how much the kids are affected and that these conversations need to happen. Because for instance, you know, they'll see maybe programs where the woman will walk up to the boyfriend and she's so upset she smacks him in the face and walks away and they think oh that's just dramatic but no that is abuse and we talk to the boys as well about the fact that boys and men are abused emotionally physically and it is not a sign of weakness usually it's because boys will not hit back and then they're in this cycle of abuse so we talk about those aspects um 
in the media with usually adults that are experienced domestic violence. You see like a movie with JLo and she has, where does she get all this money to be able to go off into this beautiful house and do all this physical training and then beat up her abuser? You know, that is not reality. Reality is that um, the people who are most vulnerable for domestic violence are people that are um, disabled, people that are in the LGBTQ plus community because maybe they're not out yet and the um, the partner uses that as a threat if they want to talk about the abuse. That is another vulnerable aspect. Um, people that have these amazing, beautiful qualities like they are a people pleaser, they're giving, they put other people before themselves, they don't want to make waves. That's that's wonderful characteristics and you should always keep those characteristics, but that makes you vulnerable for people to take advantage of you. So things that we teach our clients are, like Marcy said, the red flags to be aware of, how to go into relationships, how to have healthy boundaries with everyone from coworkers to romantic partners, to your children, to your family. Um, so we try to set a healthy path forward um, because this just isn't represented in the media. What's not represented in the media. Also, I was talking about like how people just have money. Well, I didn't know this before I started working this job. You would think that let's say someone's married and they're getting divorced. Well, the judge says you have to pay X amount of money so that your soon to be ex partner and your children aren't homeless and they don't need food and clothes. And you would think that would be a common thing, but most narcissistic abusers use their family as weapons and tools and don't think twice about leaving their children homeless, penniless, no clothes, no way to get to school. This really describes a lot of our clients' lives. Um, even if the judge says you have to pay X amount, that is civil, not criminal, and they know how to work the system and our clients could wait years before they get any money or not get any money at all. Um, housing has blown up since COVID. It's difficult to even get clients in shelters or get hotel vouchers. So um, Marcy and I definitely have our work cut out for us. It is not a smooth transition. It is not easy. We do backflips and are very excited whenever we have clients that have family in the area and uh, emotional and financial support because another red flag of abuse is isolation and secrecy. And a lot of the times our clients have children in common, but they've moved out of their the state where their family is and they can't move back because they have children in common. So they are stuck on an island of them by themselves, which is why the advocacy is so important. And a lot of our job is networking and getting to know people. Um, we have the the connections to the legal advocates, to the chiefs of police, to the the police domestic violence liaisons, to lawyers, to therapists, that not only do we refer back and forth to each other so that we get these clients the help they need, but we reach out to them because you really need a village to help somebody on their journey to healing and and becoming um, you know in a safe space. So the advocacy is so important. And in addition, you have to understand the mindset of a trauma victim. So oftentimes our clients will call us and they'll feel so bad about themselves because they'll say, I can't advocate for myself. I can't put my thoughts together. I lose my train of thought. And we'll say, well, you know what? These are PTSD symptoms. Even if you were never hit, if you were living with someone and walking on eggshells for years, never knowing what person you're going to get and never knowing with the same action, if you're going to get praised or yelled at, that puts your brain in fight or flight mode for years. And all those hormones that come out when you're in fight or flight mode, they're great if you come across a bear in the woods or a burglar trying to you know, harm you. But in your everyday life, those the, that flood of um, hormones in your body, in addition to the emotional trauma, it really takes a toll emotionally, physically, psychologically. So, so we always assure our clients that you are not degrading in your intelligence or in your emotions. This is because of the PTSD and we're going to get you the, the support that you need and we're going to advocate for you. Um, and sadly, some 
places are so busy that when a client calls, they might not get the response they need. And when we advocate, all of a sudden it's like Big Brother is watching and they and and then we get, you know, the results that we need. So it's a sad fact, but we're excited to be able to advocate for them. Um, and and uh, another interesting fact about disabilities is that many of our clients have children with disabilities because if it, that puts you in another vulnerable category. If you're a parent and you cannot work because your child is your 24-hour responsibility um, or you can only work very part-time, not enough to support yourself, what do you do when your partner is financially abusing you? What do you do when you have to stay in that school system for your child? Um, you, If you go into a shelter, it's only for 30 days. So oftentimes we don't hear from those parents until they're um, special need children are old enough that they feel like they could maybe move them or they're, they're transitioning into different services. So they're really stuck in the abuse. Um, so that is another aspect of the disabilities and the vulnerability. Hillary and Marcy, I can't thank you enough for sharing the breadth of the work you do. And, and I think really helping our listeners to understand not only what healthy relationships should look like, but to realize that abuse comes in so many forms. And I, I think many people um, often think of only one or two of the examples you gave. And so I think you're really helping to paint a really beautiful picture for how to look for troubled signs in relationships. Um, something I know that is very common theme amongst the conversations we've been having across this season has been looking at ways that our community and members of the disabled community need to communicate how they need to set boundaries and have certain attitudinal relationships with the with others in their life um, so even the collaboration of the people in their life to ensure that they have a voice i think is really important and to to hear that you give those opportunities both in individual and group settings um, is is a really beautiful thing to be able to share with our community so i can't thank you both enough for the work you're doing Thank you. And, you know, we go to Weinberg Commons and we talk to the kids there about relationships, boundaries, and something as simple as consent. And most people are not up to date on the consent laws. So, for instance, we'll talk to um, all different groups of people about consent. So we always start off by saying, what is the phrase that best describes consent? Do you think it's yes means yes or do you think it's no means no? So what would you guys say? Rose and Adam. Well, I'm a big supporter of, uh, oh gosh, actually, no, now that I think about it, that's a really big question. Right? I guess it has to be yes means yes, because an absence of a yes is not, or an absence of a no is not a yes. Man, that's a tongue twister. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> you got it, Rose. You got it. And most people don't know that. So exactly. You like the exact phrase that we use that the absence of no does not mean yes. And not only that, it is now affirmative consent. So in the wording of the law of confirm affirmative consent, it says not only do you have to hear a yes throughout from both parties, but it has to be a clear and enthusiastic yes. So we explain to our clients that if you hear, okay, oh, sort of, all right, that is not consent. And if you're incapacitated on drugs and alcohol, you cannot consent. There's so many different laws to consent. So even that alone, we could talk to people for an hour about. Um, and when you speak to clients and you ask them those difficult questions and you say, have you, are you being sexually assaulted? People don't realize that, you know, I don't care if you've been married for 40 years, you still need consent. It could be nonverbal consent at that point, but you still need consent. And many victims don't realize that they're also being sexually assaulted because they think it's their obligation all different reasons. So um, that's why education is so important. We don't just educate the teens, we educate lay leaders in the community, we educate professionals like veterinarians because there's such a big correlation between pet abuse and domestic abuse and the victim is usually the one who brings the pet. Um, we educate dentists because most abuse ha happens from the head up. We all different kinds of professionals. And I'll give you an example. I had a broke, I had a wrist surgery and I had a cast on for a really long time. And I said to my surgeon, do you ever ask your clients, do you feel safe at home? 
And he said, no, because I don't want to have to report it. And I was like, ah, I have to educate you and your staff because domestic violence is not a mandated report for teenagers going through dating violence or for adults. Teenagers going through dating violence, like with their peers, that is not considered child abuse. So it's not a mandated report. So it's so important that we let teens know this because if they didn't know that, they would not go and seek professional help. They, they'll they just talk to their friends and they won't do anything about it. And um, for adults, I know, Adam, you had asked me in the past, um, does it have to be reported? Do they have to go to the authorities? And the answer is no, because it's twofold. One, if everyone's lives blew up without without their consent or control when they reached out for help, nobody would reach out for help. And secondly, people that are being abused are being controlled, like Marcy had mentioned. So if you say to someone, you have to leave them, you have to do X, Y, and Z, you're taking over the role of the abuser because you are now controlling their actions. So what we do is we work on the empowerment model and we offer options, resources, navigating the system, lots of support. We rely heavily on our clients' opinions and gut instincts because no one knows the abuser better than their than their victim. And, and they make their own choices. And it's a non-judgmental um, atmosphere. So some people will come and talk to us and then we won't see them again for a year, but they know they come back when they're ready. So we never press anybody and that's really the best way to handle it. And when we talk to people in the community and lay leaders, we let them know that if you come across this, if you're a hairdresser and somebody is telling you that they're being you know, abused, all these different things, do not force a person to leave, threaten them to leave, you know, to have to leave because most murders happen when someone is thinking about leaving or leaving. So you don't want to be responsible for someone, God, God forbid, getting really, really injured. So that is why we would suggest to everyone that you encourage that person to call someone like us and speak confidentially to an advocate. They don't even have to give us their real name. Um, and it doesn't go any further. I've been doing this for 11 years. No one's confidence has ever been broken. I know some people are worried that the people that work in our program or in the community and will they talk, but it's never happened and it never will because we take our responsibilities really seriously. Thank you so much for that comprehensive breakdown of, you know, the signs, the symptoms and what help can look like. So for our listeners, if after listening to this, they're thinking back and they think that their situation or someone that they care about um, might fit into those guidelines of an unhealthy relationship. What do you recommend is that first step for them of where to go and what it could look like at the other end of that phone call? I would honestly recommend them to call us. They don't even have to give us their name. We oftentimes have family members and friends call us. They get a comprehensive overview of what we do. And that way they can bring it back to their friend or family member who might be hesitant and um, give them a little more confidence and reassurance. And nine times out of 10, then that person will give us a call. Or they can call JFCS and ask for Project Sarah or ask for Hillary or Marcy. And um, we can talk to them in the utmost confidence. They also don't have to give their name. We don't want to give um, anyone any pressure. We just want to let them know that there is so many supports out there. I mean, we help with legal resources, housing resources, vocational resources, nutritional resources, emotional with our group and with um, our therapy, um, our counseling department. We might be able to help financially. A lot of people do not realize that if they have a paper trail of abuse, like an assault charge or a restraining order, even if it was dropped, that they have actually a lot of monetary resources available to them. And then, of course, we also talk about personal care resources, because as I mentioned, most victims are the kind of people that put themselves last. So, and if they've been involved in the abuse, they haven't gotten their haircut, their teeth cleaned, new eyeglasses, clothes, um, 
all different aspects we try to help because we know that's like one big package and we want to be there for them in every aspect. I'm so appreciative of what you all offer the community. Um, we're definitely going to put the information and phone numbers in our show notes, but any chance you have that phone number on hand so they know how to reach you? Of course. It's 856-424-1333. And also, um, we'll, we're giving you our Sarah resource guide, which is a really special resource guide because this is created by not only Project Sarah, but we add to it every time we have a support group because we really value our support group members resources and they have some amazing resources. So it's really a mix of professionals, uh, shelters, legal, all that kind of stuff, taxes, free taxes, but it's also um, assertiveness statements that our clients have given us. It's books, it's blogs, it's apps, it's all different kinds of resources to help um, with people going through it. So we'll give that to you and you'll be able to, um, you know, have that available for people watching this. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Well, we're so we're so appreciative that you gave us this platform because it's it's so important that we just keep talking about domestic violence and making it not a myth for people to think it doesn't happen around here. It doesn't happen to me. Um, unfortunately, it does not discriminate. Well, thank you for what you do. Um, Adam, anything else that you want to add to this conversation? I just, again, want to thank Marcy and Hillary for joining us, for letting our community know what resources are available to them, uh, and to really, again, shed light on what domestic abuse and violence looks like and ways that we can help not only the loved ones in our lives, but our community be in a better space and healthy relationships. And so, again, really applaud the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I wanted to thank everybody for listening to the Jewish Disability Services Together We Make an Impact podcast. This episode was made possible by our sponsor, the Jewish Community Foundation. We thank you for your commitment to making an impact in the disability community, and we hope you'll continue to follow our conversations. Until next time.